Greetings, Earth and Space Explorers. Welcome to Doc Waller's Earth and Space Report for Friday, July 30, 2021. I'm your host, Bill Waller, an astronomer, science educator, and communicator coming to you this evening from Bucks Harbor Yacht Club in Maine. These Earth and Space Reports are intended for people like you who are curious about our home planet, who care about its life-sustaining environment, and who wonder about the greater cosmos, including our place in space and moment in time. This month, we are fortunate to have Andrew Shainer, a senior education specialist with the Lunar and Planetary Institute. I'm just gonna bring up his information for the last bit. Um, since joining LPI in July, 2009, he has been involved in multiple education projects, including professional development experiences for early career scientists, teachers, public librarians, and camp professionals. He is currently principal investigator for the Planetary Resources and Content Heroes Project, funded by NASA's Science Activation Program. And then uh, his bio goes on and on after that. Uh, so uh, today, however, Andy will talk on today's solar system. It ain't what it used to be. So Andy, uh, please, please feel free to take it away. All right, great, thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm gonna share my uh, screen here so I can bring up my PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. I assume you're all seeing that blue and white slide now. Great. Okay, well, well thank you uh, for having me on. Uh, I, I'll be really honest, I don't give too many presentations, at least public presentations like this. Uh, so I apologize <laughs> right, right off the bat, but uh, here we go. Um, so yeah, so what I'm gonna do is give you a little quick introduction about of myself, um, and then I'll talk about, about what the LPI is, because I'm sure most of you probably have never heard of us. If you have, awesome. Um, but I'll give you a little a quick history of who, where we come from and what we are, what we do today. Uh, then I'm going to get into the solar system exploration. What is some stuff that's going on now or has been uh, in the past few months or will be happening in the future uh, to give you a sense of where we are in a state of exploring the solar system? Uh, I certainly can't talk about everything, uh, but kind of some of the bigger things uh, that are happening um, to hopefully give you an idea that the solar system is quite different. Uh, at least in the way we understand it than it was even 20 years ago when I was an undergrad. Um, uh, just real exciting stuff happening. So we'll chat a little bit about that. Then I'll tell you a little bit more about me, uh, where I come from, uh, how I got here. Um, and then a few things at the end to talk more about how you can get involved, ways you can participate uh, in our exploration of the solar system. Uh, so as Bill said, I'm with the Lunar and Planetary Institute, uh, which is, it's a NASA Institute, so it's it's something that is known in NASA circles or in government circles as a cooperative agreement. So the University Space Research Association or USRA is technically who I work for. And this USRA is has an agreement with NASA to manage their LPI, their Lunar and Planetary Institute. Um, this is a sign out in front of our building. This was about four years ago in December. Uh, we don't get snow like this ever <laughs> or very often in Houston. Uh, so when we do, uh, we like to document it thoroughly. Uh, it's just a great, it's a nice, pretty picture. Um, when I'm not working, um, I am helping my wife uh, entertain our two kids, uh, Hudson and Stella, um, which pretty much then takes up the rest of my time. Uh, when I do have time, uh, which is usually like a nap time for the kids on the weekend, uh, I like to do genealogical uh, research. Um, and one of the, personally anyway, one of the cool things I discovered about eight years ago is there's a tiny village that sits right on the right on the border of Allentown and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's called Shanersville, based off this is the original spelling of our last name, uh, and it's named after the half brother of my four times great grandfather. So same father, different mother. Uh, I've I've been there, got to visit it. There's not much to it, um, but it was pretty cool, uh, a pretty cool thing to see. Okay, so about the LPI. As I said, we're here in Houston. 
Uh, ALPI was founded back in 1968, originally as the Lunar Science Institute. Um, the, whole, the whole idea was that there was a recognition that the samples being brought back by the Apollo astronauts had very had great scientific value to them. And so while you had the engineers over at Johnson Space Center, although at that time it was called the Manned, Space, uh, Manned Spacecraft Center, um, putting this, you know, getting ready to send the astronauts and talk to them while they were up there, there was going to be another component where we'd have the scientists from all around the world could come together to, to research the rocks and then uh, write the papers on them. So that was the point of the LSI was to be this, um, this focal point for that research uh, once the samples started coming back. So LBJ was at the Manned Spacecraft Center in March to announce the creation of this institute. Um, it was a big hullabaloo um, and we still exist 50 years later, over 50 years later. Uh, in the early days, so like I mentioned, we, it's scientists were coming together to discuss lunar science. Uh, it was a, a real great shift from seeing the moon as this astronomical object as viewed through telescopes uh, to a geologic object. You know, a, a whole world on its own with geology, very diverse geology and a, and a history and an evolution. Uh, so there were lots of meetings that took place. Um, the very first was called the Apollo Lunar Science Conference was held in January of 1970. It was held in downtown Houston. Um, that conference still happens today. Uh, I'll get, I'll see a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, but this has been going on every year since then. And of course has just grown. Uh, and that picture on the upper left, that's another meeting that was held at one point. The uh, gentleman uh, standing with his arms crossed on the left side of the picture, that's uh, Harrison Schmidt, who was the only geologist to walk on the moon uh, in Apollo during Apollo 17. So it's fun to see these old pictures of these guys that um, you see today, uh, just to see them as very young. Uh, the bottom in the middle there is a picture of the first intern class uh, from the Lunar Science Institute uh, back in 1977. We started taking interns over the summer. Uh, still do that to this day. In fact, this year's class of interns will be presenting their research next week uh, to wrap up their experience. Uh, and there on the bottom on the left is a picture of the post-mission briefing after the first flight of the space shuttle. Uh, there on the, on the left there, that's Bob Crippen, who was the commander of that mission. So that, that mission briefing was uh, held at the LPI. Uh, so today, over 50 years later, uh, we not only study the moon, but the entire solar system. So in the, about the mid 70s, there was a recognition as uh, lunar funding was dwindling, there was more funding being um, allocated for solar system research as a whole. So this is like the Voyager and the Pioneer days. Um, so recognizing that the director at the time decided to change the name to the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Um, and today, like I said, our scientists study every solid, any, every object in the solar system with a solid surface. So that leads out, that leaves out, of course, the gas giants. Uh, because most of our scientists are geologists uh, or, or geochemists by training. Um, so we, <laughs> as one of our scientists, Dr. Paul Shane calls them, we leave the gas bags to the physicists and the um, atmospheric scientists to study. Uh, so we continue to host and coordinate the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference every March. Uh, it's held down here in this area. This is what was originally the Apollo Science Conference. It's now LPSC for short. Uh, this is the largest conference of its kind in the country. Uh, that's specifically devoted to planetary science. Uh, we have about 2,000 people attend. Uh, about as many abstracts are submitted each year. Of course, not that many abstracts are accepted. Uh, and other various meetings uh, for the planetary community and other science communities. Uh, are we have a meetings group that's really top notch that, that just knows how to put on a meeting, doesn't matter what your subject area is. Um, as I mentioned, we, we now have two summer intern programs. One is the original that supports undergraduate students. And another one is specifically for graduate students. And what this program does is introduces them to mission planning. So they will do, um, for example, they will plan traverse astronaut traverses or a rover traverse uh, on the moon. And this is something we've been doing for a, about a decade now. And an education and public engagement program of which uh, I am a part of. Okay, so what's going on out there in the solar system? What are, what are we learning and what are we 
what are we doing to learn uh, those things? Uh, excitingly, for the first time in 30 years, we are going to send spacecraft back to Venus. <clears throat> the last time we did that was Magellan, launched back in 1990. Uh, we're sending two uh, in the next decade. Uh, one of them is called Da Vinci, and I'll let you read what that acronym means there. Uh, it's launching about 2029, but 2028 to 2030 timeframe is the target right now. This mission and another was just selected uh, in the past few months. So they're at the very early stages of the, of the mission planning. Um, this is going to be an orbiter that also has a probe. So the orbiter will spend, I think, a year or two in orbit around Venus taking data, looking specifically um, at the um, uh, determining, looking at the chemical, the composition of the atmosphere, and also uh, looking at some compositions uh, of the um, surface, uh, as well as as light comes back uh, through the uh, through the thick atmosphere of Venus into the spacecraft. After a couple of years, it will detach the probe, and that probe will descend through the atmosphere and really get some good uh, composition data for the atmosphere and pressure data, that kind of uh, that kind of stuff. And as it gets towards near the surface, it'll take very high resolution images uh, comparable to what you might get from like the Mars rovers, for example, um, as it gets very, very close to the surface. So those will be the highest resolution images we have of the surface of Venus once we have them, of course. Um, and so that won't all be, though, until the, about the 2030s, uh, assuming everything stays on schedule. Uh, two of our LPI scientists, Dr. Walter Kiefer and Dr. Justin Filiberto, are both co-investigators. So they'll be on the science teams, uh, science team for this mission. So that's exciting to have them involved. Um, so we don't really know much about Venus in general. To, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons I really like Venus is because of what we don't know about it. Um, as of right now, this is our best um, assumptions for what the atmospheric constituents of Venus are, uh, chemically, as individual elements. Um, we don't have uh, sulfuric acid on here because that's a molecule. This is simply just showing the simple elemental composition, uh, the top five elements uh, in the atmosphere of Venus. And uh, this is the best we know in terms of uh, Venus. We we, our surface, we have guesses for the surface based on the morphology you know, what the types of um, uh, geology we see, but even that's from radar data and that's 30 year old radar data. Um, that's not very high resolution, but that's, that's gonna change. Uh, the second mission to Ven Venus uh, that's been selected is called Veritas. Uh, by the way, um, Da Vinci is being run out of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Veritas is gonna be run out of the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. This is an orbiter as well. And it is going to have a higher uh, definite, higher resolution radar than what Magellan had. Um, and it will be also taking measurements of the surface composition through radiation, uh, ultraviolet and UV, ultraviolet and infrared radiation coming off the surface back out to the spacecraft. Um, both of these spacecraft are really trying to answer this very basic question. Why are Earth and Venus so different? They're about the same size. They're located in approximately the same area of the solar system uh, in terms of distance from the sun. Um, but why are they so different? Why do they take such different evolutionary paths to where Earth is habitable today? And Venus certainly is not. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, so, sorry about that. They're vacuuming out in the hall. Um, uh, there is data supporting that Venus may have once been more Earth-like way back in the past. If that's true, what happened uh, to change that? Uh, also, this question of were there plate tectonics on Venus? Um, some data from Magellan. Uh, we can we're, we can use new uh, new techniques and new software to tease out what looks like might be plate boundaries on Venus. Uh, but we're not sure this new radar on Veritas will really help us answer that question. Uh, this is the best data we have for the surface of Venus right now. Uh, this is actually a global map of Venus spread out. I've just put the top is the radar data from Magellan, the bottom is uh, topography data from Magellan, and the, the equator is right there where those two meet. 
Um, so all we can really tell are we have high and low areas uh, from Magellan, and then we have bright and not so bright spots in the radar imaging on top. Um, uh, from that, we can kind of tell um, and based on the morphology of the things that we see on the surface, we can kind of tell what the composition might be where, I mean, we were kind of leaning towards basaltic in nature, like the Mari on the moon uh, or Mars or the ocean floor of Earth, for example. Um, but we really just don't know. And these two missions are really going to give us really good data on that. And really, uh, you know, like Magellan, you could argue, rewrote, you know, the textbooks on Venus 30 years ago these two are going to do it all over again. Um, coming a little closer to home with the moon, um, this is a great example of how even though the Apollo missions are over, we are still analyzing and still studying those samples. So in addition to the rocks that were brought back and have been looked at for the past 50 years, just two years ago, they for the first time opened up these uh, core samples that the astronauts took on the while on the surface. Uh, in the lower left, you can see an X-ray image of the same core sample. On the bottom, that's an X-ray image from 1974. And on the top, that's an X-ray image from two years ago. So it's the same sample, um, but much better, much better view of it in X-rays uh, 50, almost 50 years later. Uh, so when they first brought these samples back, these core samples, they knew they weren't going to open them for a long time because they knew the technology would get better uh, with time. And then they could decide when a more appropriate time would be to open uh, these cores. So there are teams across the country that are opening these cores and doing analysis of the rocks and, and the sample, the, the, the small rocks and the fine grain material in those that were buried. You've been buried for millions, if not billions of years from the moon. Uh, so that'll really give us a, a real window into the, the past, um, into the moon's past. Uh, that picture on the left, that's Gene Cernan from Apollo 17. That's how he's preparing to take this core that we see um, in that X-ray image. And the image there in the top right are uh, three scientists at the Johnson Space Center in the curation, lunar curation lab, um, looking at the, um, the cores a couple of years ago. Um, Later in a couple of years, 2023, we're going to launch what's called the Viper rover. Uh, this is going to the South Polar region near the South Pole of, of the moon. Uh, that's, that is of great interest right now, as it's a consideration for sending Artemis astronauts there uh, in 2024. Um, this is an illustration of what the rover will look like. Uh, one thing you may notice about the rover is the solar panels are on the side. They're not on the top. And that's because at the south pole of the moon, the moon doesn't have a tilt, at least as much as the Earth does. It's very, very uh, slight tilt, uh, axial tilt. Uh, so as a consequence, at the poles, north and south, the sun is always right on the horizon. So there's no point in putting solar panels on top of the rover. You want to put them on the side where you're going to get the most uh, sunlight. And that is when you're not in a shadowed area. So uh, craters on the moon uh, are... Uh, for the most part, they have these, uh, they're raised rims around the outside, around the edges of them. So anytime the sun goes behind a rim, you're going to be in darkness. Um, so if you think about how the moon goes around the earth once every 30 days, um, a lunar night, if you will, where, where when um, half of the moon's not facing the sun, uh, that's a 15 day, it's two weeks where it's in darkness. Um, there are some areas within, especially the low-lying areas within craters, that see zero sunlight and haven't for possibly billions of years, um, millions of years at the most, hundreds of millions of years. Uh, these are areas where we believe we have data to show that there's ice in there. Um, we don't think it's sheets, you know, just these sheets of meters of ice. It's more likely ice that's locked up in the regolith. It's locked up in the dirt. Uh, but there appears to be a significant amount of it, even if it's locked up that way. So one of the roles of this rover is to look for that ice in uh, some permanently shadowed regions near the South Pole. Now, a permanently shadowed region could also be in the shadow of a huge boulder that just is in a position where it never sees sunlight. Um, and we have the resolution to see boulders like that, which I'll show you here in a little bit. 
So the South Pole of the Moon is right on the rim of a crater called Shackleton, which is named for the South Polar Explorer from here on Earth 100 years ago or so. Uh, and the image on the left, you can see right in the crosshairs, that's right there in the middle is the South Pole of the Moon uh, on the rim of Shackleton Crater. And here's a good example of how you can see Shackleton, the floor never sees sunlight. The rim does over the course of, of a month or the lunar year, if you will. The rim will see sunlight, different parts of the rim will see sunlight, uh, but inside the walls and on the floor, it does not see sunlight. So there is bound to be lots of ice down there uh, locked up in the regolith of the moon. On the right, there's a picture, it's an, an oblique image uh, looking at a Shackleton crater. Um, here is a very, very zoomed in oblique image of the illuminated rim of Shackleton taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, camera. Uh, and in this particular image, the South Pole, the moon is up in this area roughly, the actual geographic, the South Pole. Um, and in this image, we zoom in a little more and the South Pole, the moon is roughly in this area. This image is a little, um, it's about 12 years old. Uh, so in the caption for it, it talks about how it may be off a few meters or hundreds of meters of the location, but more or less it's in this area. These boulders field you see here on the far left and even some up here in the left center uh, on top. These, uh, the smallest boulders that you can see here, like for example, that one are about three meters in diameter. Um, so these are, you know, coffee table sized boulders. Um, and so at the resolution like this, we can see where there are shadows and where there may be permanently shadowed areas behind, just behind a boulder, not necessarily on the floor of a crater. So lots of potential places uh, for Viper and for future astronauts to explore. Uh, moving on to Mars, uh, we have the InSight lander that touched down there about three years ago with the main purpose of detecting Mars quakes or earthquakes on Mars, uh, all to better understand what the interior of Mars is like, what it, how it's structured. Uh, we have a very good idea of what the interior of Earth is structured like based off of our earthquakes that we measure here and knowing the properties of physics and how waves uh, move through solids and liquids or um, molten things, just understanding all that, how waves get diffracted when you encounter different mediums of different densities, we've been able to get a pretty good picture of what the Earth's core is like. Uh, InSight is helping to do that and Mars certainly is not disappointing. Um, I think up till this, till recently, they've re detected over 700 uh, Mars quakes, most around th three to fourth magnitude. Um, but in three papers that came out just this week, um, each paper uh, from the InSight mission, each paper is describing uh, what our initial results are and our um, kind of our new understanding of what the interior of Mars is structured. Uh, so one paper was about the crust, a second paper was about the mantle, and the third paper was about the core. Um, so in terms of the core, it's a little thinner than, than, than has been expected. Um, and depending on whether or not there's two or three sub layers, which more analysis of, of data will should bring out over the coming years, uh, that crust either 12 or 23 miles thick, it's a little thinner. Uh, the mantle then extends down another 969 miles below the surface. And the core has been quite a surprise. From what there's from this data is showing us that it is a molten iron core. So not solid. So the earth has the, the, the inner core of the earth is solid iron. The outer core is a liquid or a molten. Um, so we don't know if there is an iron core in the middle of that, hoping to get more data to, or to tease more data out to see if that's the case. Uh, but that was a surprise. It's a surprise because Mars does not have a global magnetic field. At least it doesn't today. And based on our understanding of how planetary uh, scale magnetic fields are formed, you've got to have a liquid interior and a solid interior. You've got, or you've got to at least have a solid and liquid interior sloshing around to create that um, electric field that will then create a magnetic field. Um, but Mars doesn't have it. So this is, this is a surprise to see a molten iron core, a liquid core moving around, sloshing around, so to speak, though that's not very accurate. Sloshing is not a good word to use. Uh, another surprise is this, it's bigger. The core is larger than we would expect. Uh, it's over half the radius of Mars or half the diameter 
uh, of Mars. Um, that has been a surprise as well. So more data will be coming in. Uh, they'll be taking a closer look at those data, kind of filtering out the noise out of the seismographs uh, that, that are caused just by the wind blowing against the instrument. Um, but exciting stuff from Mars, from the interior and more to come. And this has consequent uh, consequences, but this has implications for better understanding the formation of Mars and its evolution. Um, there is a model right now called the Grand Tack model, which explains why the planets are where they are in the solar system, uh, given their, their sizes and their characteristics, um, their properties. This could have implications on that model for just as, as an example. So things are always changing. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I was watching, I took an astronomy class as an undergrad. Well, I took a, a few, but the first one I took, I was watching this video at home with my mom. And uh, I remember she made a comment. We didn't know this when I was a kid. And so it was kind of funny because I would, I would tell my kids now that if, you know, they watched the kind of shows that I watch, but uh, they don't. <laughs> Uh, Osiris Rex was sent to asteroid Bennu five years ago in September of 2016. It has completed its mission at Bennu in mapping, uh, imaging the entire surface, mapping the surface's composition, and taking a sample and to bring it back here to Earth. So uh, the spacecraft left Bennu on May 10th and is scheduled to come back on September 24th of 2023. As the spacecraft approaches the Earth, it will let go of a capsule containing the samples. The plan is for that capsule then to come through the atmosphere, parachute down to the Utah test range, where it will be recovered by scientists and those samples will be brought back here to Johnson Space Center uh, for, for curation. Uh, we, NASA actually has a deal with the Japanese space agency to allow Japan to have um, a portion of the sample that comes back. Um, Japan has had two successful asteroid return missions called Hayabusa, um, or one, I don't remember. Anyway, they, they do have at least one, and they had an agreement with NASA where NASA would get some of those samples as well. So in exchange, um, they will get uh, some of the OSIRIS-REx samples. So that will be coming back in another couple of years, more exciting stuff, a sample return from asteroids. Um, this next one, this is, a, this is a GIF. This is 82 um, different images put together showing the sample arm on OSIRIS-REx hitting the surface of Bennu, getting its sample and pulling right back up again. Um, so this is what was called tag or the touch and go maneuver uh, to get the sample. It was a quite ingenious way. Uh, basically when that, when that sampler hit the surface, it would it, it, uh, put a burst of nitrogen gas onto the surface that then kicked up the debris and then came up into the collector and then brought it pulled back, um, and then stowed it, and now it's on its way home. Uh, in October 16th of this year, another mission to the asteroid, to asteroid is launching, it's called Lucy. Uh, the Lucy mission is actually named after the skeleton, the, the early hominid, hominid that was discovered uh, some time ago. Um, because just like that discovery has helped um, scientists better understand human evolution, um, this mission will better help planetary scientists understand the evolution of the solar system. Uh, asteroids, as you probably know, are you know some of the building blocks, the remnants of solar system formation. So they within them they record the very early solar system, what things were like um, back at that time. So this will launch on October sixteenth of this year. Well, that's when the launch date opens, the window opens. So hopefully it'll go the first time. Um, the total mission is going to be about 12 years. Of course, it's going to take a long time. It is going to visit Trojan asteroids, uh, which share an orbit with Jupiter. So there are some uh, Trojans that are on the leading edge. They lead Jupiter around the sun, and there are some that tra trail Jupiter around the sun. It's going to visit seven asteroids. I'm not saying in, uh, the, <laughs> all four beetles are represented on here. Um, uh, Davis Sobel, who's a really great uh, science history and science fiction author. If you've ever read her books, uh, you're well aware of her. Einstein has a quote on there, for example. So this is going to be, this is on the spacecraft um, and will be out there for posterity. 
Okay, so that's that's some of the more exciting stuff or, or new stuff happening or has happened in the past couple of months or is happening in the next few months. Uh, there's more I could have talked about, but I didn't want to spend too much time um, um, on that because uh, I did have a time limit. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about me and kind of how I got here. Um, so I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas, uh, which is not exactly... It doesn't is not a location that comes to mind when you think astronomy or you think space science. Uh, given that, though, I did have opportunities that I took advantage of, um, and, and and other experiences that impacted me. You know, as I look back now, I realize they had an impact on me. Um, near in the left, upper left, so there's a picture. Like a little kid drew a picture of a moon with a flag. I drew that when I was in kindergarten. Um, it was part of some class thing we did. I, we drew pictures of all the planets and the moon and the sun. Um, and I came across it when I was home from grad school one Christmas because moms keep everything. And she happened to pull this out and show it to me. Um, and so recently I've been showing that from time to time uh, since I do a lot of things with the moon right now. Uh, Garden on the Moon is a novel by Pierre Boulet. Uh, science fiction. If that name rings a bell, he wrote Bridge Over the River Kwai and The Planet of the Apes, those original books. If you have a chance to read that, if you haven't, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's about the space race and has a very interesting twist at the end of it. And that's all I'm going to say. But I would really recommend you read that book. I read that when I was in high school. Um, when I got to college, when I was an undergraduate at Wichita State University, where I did my bachelor's in secondary education, uh, I worked at a public observatory. Uh, just outside, just to the west of Wichita, uh, leading public programs during the weekends. Uh, I also had a chance to work at the Science Center that actually didn't open until um, the year 2000 in Wichita. I was a planetarium presenter there. Uh, I also was part of a, um, my manager wrote a grant to NASA, it was a particular grant, education grant at the time, where we were able to purchase two telescopes, uh, a C8 and a four inch Orion refractor. And we bought an H alpha filter and a white light filter. And we use those to show visitors the sun uh, on sunny days. Um, so I got experience uh, speaking with the public about the sun and about astronomy in general at the observatory. Uh, so there are some early influences. Uh, in the op Mars opposition to 2003, we had the telescope set up at the Science Center for visitors to come see uh, Mars and talk to them about it. And that was really fun. Um, the, my, my manager there at the Science Center also had a profound um, influence on me. He's an astronomer, uh, has, but, but works in plant, the planetarium field. He taught me the difference between looking through a telescope and observing through a telescope. I'll never, I'll never forget that. Uh, and finally, there's a little space, well, it's not little really, it's a space museum uh, it's in a town called Hutchinson, about 40 miles northwest of Wichita. It's called the Kansas Cosmosphere. This museum, it's a space museum that is second only to the Smithsonian in its collection of US space artifacts. In fact, they house the, um, the Apollo 13 command module uh, is, or not the command module, the, yeah, the command module is there. Um, and second only in Russian space artifacts uh, to some museum in, in, in Russia. So I lived not, grew up not too far from there and made lots of trips um, when I was young. Uh, so I graduated from Wichita State, um, had my licenses to teach physics and earth-based science at the high school level. Um, but while I was there, I was like, you know, I'm not sure that's what I wanna do. And at the same time, I was really getting into astronomy and the science of it and astrophysics. I had taken some, uh, you know, calc-based astrophysics courses. Um, I was really getting into that. And so then I had an opportunity to go to graduate school at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, although I knew I didn't want to do research either, but I didn't want to be in a classroom. So anyway, I found out there was a research team there as an astronomy education research team. And so it was kind of this nice fit right in the middle of what I thought I wanted to do. So I applied, got in uh, through the College of Education, which is there, that picture in the top left. Um, spent a lot of time there, of course. Uh, the picture on the left is the Kuiper Space Sciences Building. That's the home of the Planetary Science Department and the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. Um, spent uh, time there. I, so I did a master's in uh, teaching and teacher education with a minor in planetary science. 
So what I did to get paid as a grad student was I worked in the education program for the Mars Phoenix mission. Uh, this mission launched in uh, August of 2007, landed in May of 2008. It landed near the North Pole of Mars. Uh, there's a picture, a panoramic uh, taken by the spacecraft there at the bottom. Uh, and this picture I have as an inset on the left is, um, it's, it's, it, it speaks to me a lot because in January of 2007, I had a chance to go to Lockheed Martin where the spacecraft was built. And I had a chance to put on uh, a clean suit and get in, well, the bunny suit, they call it, get in the clean room, I mean, fully garbed, gloves, mask, hairnet, everything. I got to go in and stand right next to the lander and get on a ladder and take pictures of it. It was, it was, it was awesome. And then a year and a half later to see it sitting on the surface of Mars, uh, has seen from orbit there in that picture on the left, uh, taken by the high-rise camera that's orbiting Mars. Um, and we knew, the mission knew, that it would only last for at most five or six months. After that time, the winter would set in in the northern hemisphere of Mars, and at the pole, CO2 ice condenses down to the surface and forms ice, dry ice. And we knew that there would probably be enough that the spacecraft wouldn't survive the winter. So it turns out when the winter was over, a high rise image, this, the landing site again, and there you can see in 2010, it's very dark. There's not a lot of reflection. We, it was probably destroyed um, by the ice just shifting over the course of the winter. So that was just, uh, it, that, that, that's always just made, had an impression on me, how I got to see it before it launched, saw the launch, saw it sitting there, and then saw it um, after it kind of been basically destroyed. Um, just take a moment to say that, uh, uh, about, about Star Trek, and that is that Star Trek did not influence me. Uh, I don't have anything against Star Trek. <laughs> it's, it was just, particularly the original series, it was just before my time. Um, the, there was movies that came out um, when I was younger, and I, I liked them. Uh, it's, it's just not something that inspired me. And there are a lot of people in this field uh, who were inspired, uh, particularly engineers that I know who were inspired by Star Trek. A lot of my friends that I went to school, grad school with love Star Trek. I'm just not one of them. But I will tell you what did. I really thought about this and my turning point to get interested in space science really came the summer before my senior year of high school. That was 1997. Uh, the movie Contact came out that summer and the Mars Pathfinder rover landed on Mars on the 4th of July that year. I can remember sitting at home, just flipping channels on that day, and I think it was on CNN, they were showing shots of this, and I was, whoa, I was blown away by it. And in a weird twist of fate, later that year, there was a newspaper article um, about results from uh, that mission. And there, the um, gentleman who built the camera that took this image from Pathfinder, he is quoted a few times in the article. And at the time, I cut it out. I'm like, okay, it's about Mars. That's cool. I want to cut it out. I'm, I'm going to hang on to it. Um, then that same year when I found when I was home for Christmas, or that year when I was home for Christmas, and my mom showed me that picture, uh, I found that I came across this article and I'm reading through it again. And I was like, wait a minute. The guy they quoted, the guy who designed the camera for Pathfinder, Peter Smith, was my boss on the Mars mission. He was the principal investigator for the Mars Phoenix mission. His office is 20 feet down the hallway from mine. So that was one of those um, little twist of faith things where I was really blown away by that. So I took that article back to Tucson with me, um, um, got a picture I had of me and Peter, glued them on a piece of paper together and put them in a frame. And I've, I've, I've still got that frame. Um, all right, a couple of things you all can do uh, to get involved with this, our exploration of the solar system. Uh, there's lots of citizen science programs out there um, related to either astronomy um, or planetary science. Uh, this one, just an example, is called Planet Hunters Tests. Uh, you look at um, uh, light curves to see if there is a possible transiting uh, exoplanet in, front, um, in that data. Uh, this is something you can do just from your computer at home or on your tablet or your iPhone, for example. Uh, for other examples of citizen science things that you can do, uh, there's a NASA has a web page with a whole bunch of them that you can uh, get involved with. This is science.nasa.gov slash citizen science. So check that out. There's also earth science. Um, uh, 
citizen science applications uh, as well. And some of you may actually may know about International Observe the Moon Night. Uh, astronomy clubs are a big uh, part of this. Uh, this is an annual event every year. It's held in September or October. It depends on the moon phase. Um, this year, it's October 16th. Uh, I sit on the coordinating committee for this event. Um, right now, we are working on putting together an hour-long event that will be broadcast through NASA TV uh, on NASA TV and the social media uh, channels like uh, YouTube, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we'll be looking for that on October 16th. If your club is going to participate, we or if you as an individual even participate, um, you can go to you can go to the website there and register your your event or that you were at home and you observe the moon. It, it don't need telescopes, as you all know. You don't even need micro uh, uh, binoculars. It's just there. And the whole goal of this event is to just encourage people to go out and look at the moon and to learn something about uh, lunar science uh, and the solar system. Um, this year, I believe, is the 12th year of this event. And I've been with it every year. So it's, it's been interesting to watch it, watch it grow. All right, I'm gonna stop. So uh, thank you all uh, for the opportunity and I'll, I will certainly try to answer any questions you may have. Well, okay, uh, that was wonderful and sweeping. Uh, there's just so much, uh, there is just so much to the solar system and uh, the, uh, the objects there, they have such different personalities that you have to have so many approaches, even with the solid objects. Uh, that was interesting to me as well that uh, LPI focuses on the solid objects. Um, does that include the, uh, the solid objects in orbit around um, Jupiter and Saturn? Yes, it does. It does. And, and uh, uh, any moon that's large enough where we can really study its geology around any of the gas giants, uh, we mm -hmm. do. Uh, Paul Schenk in particular um, has done a lot of mapping and created a lot of maps of, uh, of those moons. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Bill Wall uh, is interested in uh, asking a question. Sure. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm George Talk. Um, I should say that I was inspired by Star Trek, you know, despite its flaws, um, and not the least because uh, two of the stars happen to be Canadians. Um, so, uh, are there still rocks at LPI, uh, lunar rocks at LPI? The LPI, no, we don't have uh, uh, like research, like instruments for rocks. We're mostly office space. Um, rocks are all housed over at Johnson Space Center uh, mm. in the lunar, uh, called the Lunar Sample Laboratory. We do occasionally have rocks here, um, meteorites, uh, sometimes lunar samples. If um, um, we do have some microscopes, and we are actually getting a, um, I think the scanning electron microscope. So we will have something like that that we can uh, analyze with. Uh, but for the most part, if our scientists need anything, they just go over to JSC. Right. Well, yeah, I, um, Bill anticipated one of my questions. So uh, another question is, you know, Da Vinci is gonna land on the surface of Venus, um, which is not a forgiving surface. So how long is, do they expect it to last? You know, I have not read anything about that. It's um, everything I have found about it doesn't say anything. Um, so I, I guess as more, as, as they get farther along and they have more, uh, information about it, I, you know, I could ask our two scientists, they probably know, um, but the longest anything has survived has been a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. So unless, um, now I know there are different technologies and different things they've considered doing, uh, to get things to last longer and, and including putting, material on that that can just like shed off like onion layers over time to ke help to keep heat off of it. I don't know if they're going to be doing that. Um, but I would say probably no more than two hours. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I have a, an educational question. You, I know you're involved with the program that engages high school students uh, mm -hmm. and um, and then also uh, you have the undergraduate and graduate programs for the internships. 
Uh, but what about uh, the teachers, uh, the, the teachers, middle, sc middle school and high school teachers in particular? Uh, as you know, the, um, the next generation science standards places earth and space science up with the other ones, the physical and the, the life sciences. And yet the, um, the amount of teaching of earth and space sciences is way below the, uh, what is being taught in, in those other sciences. And so there's so many teachers who um, are not teaching it either because their curriculum just doesn't include it or because they are not comfortable with teaching it. And so I was just wondering whether you um, had anything that could move the, uh, the level a little bit. <laughs> um, for years, until about five years ago, LPI's education program's bread and butter was teacher professional development, uh, particularly in earth and space science. Uh, mm -hmm. Christine did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleague, Christine Shupla. Mm -hmm. um, with the changes within NASA and particularly the science mission directorate, which is, that's, what, that's who's responsible for all the missions to Mars, all the missions into the solar system, all the space telescopes, all that stuff. Uh, we were funded through them. And they, six years ago, changed their approach to how they're doing education and formal, what, what they would categorize as formal education activities. So things like teacher workshops. Um, very few people are funded to do that. There is a very, they have really de-emphasized that. Uh, within the science mission directorate. Um, the Office of STEM Engagement, which kind of covers the rest of NASA, they still do professional development for teachers. Um, so, you, and you can learn about those. There's a, NASA has an e-newsletter they send out every Thursday morning um, that will have those kind of opportunities in it. Um, but yeah, that's something we used to do and is, we're honestly just not allowed to. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it'll change, right? I think so many things have changed in the past. Maybe it'll change back when you realize uh, how important it is for uh, people to understand what's going on here on Earth and uh, how inspiring it is to uh, understand what's going on in space. Absolutely, and and we've we've tried to look other places uh, for funding to do workshops like foundations and things like that, and that's uh, fortunately in our position, it's just not feasible. Sure. to, to uh, work with them. Sure. Well, uh, this, this was a far ranging. There's just so many uh, beautiful objects. Uh, I wonder if we polled uh, our audience, uh, what object would you be most excited to explore? I'm sure we would get a, a diversity of opinions. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll bet. Everybody, ha everybody has their favorite and all kinds of different reasons. My, my, I'd say mine is Venus. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love though the color of Neptune. Yes, it's a little bluer but, than Uranus and they don't know why, right? Well, so my understanding is that, so those are old pictures from Voyager, right? Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding is that it appears that blue because of a filter. Oh. Uh, in reality, it's about as bluish green as Uranus. It looked really different in a telescope. Do identifiably they? different yeah you can tell the difference between them by okay. the color well, that's good F filter or no i love that picture of neptune though i really like that color it's the background for our club logo is it okay yes, it is hey while well, i've got your attention i did have a question if that's all right bill um you were mentioning um inescapably i think that venus may have a cautionary tale to tell about global warming. Um, and I was wondering if you had heard any rumblings about uh, more panicked uh, proposals to find out where in the hell Mars's uh, magnetic field went <laughs> and its atmosphere with it, unexplained. Right, so the atmosphere question, um, it, uh, so the, the big question with that was, okay, so it lost the magnetic field, which as we know, was very important to maintain an atmosphere. Right. Um, the question of where the atmosphere then went has been at least partially answered. The MAVEN mission that launched back in 20, 
14, I believe. Um, maybe that was, yeah, anyway, when it launched, it, um, it was sent specifically as an orbiter to answer that question. And what we found, it's a little bit of both. Some of the water went into the surface, the surface and the subsurface, as we now, we see that as ice on the surface. We also uh, have dig showing it under the surface, which was actually one of the goals of the Phoenix mission was to go up there and dig into that, into the ground and uncover ice in the subsurface, which it did. Um, and some of it escaped through space. Right. So it's a little bit of both. So, so that, that now the question really is- my question. My question was, if the root cause of that phenomenon is the disappearance of the magnetic field, I would think it would generate some tension around here. <laughs> well, it, it generates a lot of interest because it's an interesting um, problem, right? And so insights starting to give us some insight into that, if you will, because um, if it does, if it has this molten core, uh, and it's not solid like we thought it was, which would mean it had cooled off long ago, which would explain why it has a magnetic field. So why does it not have a magnetic field if it at least has a molten core? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> We're still learning. Yeah. So this this could happen here next month and, and we wouldn't be surprised. Oh, uh, What's that? The loss of the magnetic field. Oh. <laughs> we wouldn't know. Of course, our, our, our deal with magnetic field now is what happens when it flips? Yeah. <laughs> For the umpteenth time. Yes, again. <laughs> yeah, it's flipped a number of times and, and life is still on Earth, so it can't be that bad. Right. That's a good point. I um, just like that it's there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of reassuring. It is. It's like <laughs> you know, all that cosmic radiation it can't be the best for you. Um, so I, I am being no. told that, uh, <laughs> I'm being told that I should be getting out of the yacht club. Uh, their little party is ending, so I'm, I'm going to uh, oh, <laughs> thank you all for for coming, and thank you, Andy, in particular, for this wonderful, uh, far-reaching talk. And I'd also like to uh, ask uh, all of you uh, to uh, consider uh, new people to give presentations. Uh, this happens monthly and I'm hoping to keep it up, but it requires a, a new people uh, willing and able to give interesting presentations in the earth and space sciences. So uh, uh, on that, I'm going to thank uh, Andy uh, one more time and uh, bid you all adieu. Take care. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Nice talk, Andrew. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you.